My name is Lauren Best. I'll be speaking with you today about reviewing for journals. And I am speaking on behalf of my co-author, Dr. Shoba Stack. We are both from the University of Washington Department of Medicine Division of General Internal Medicine. Today, my session will have three parts. I'll begin by discussing why you should consider peer reviewing manuscripts and get you started thinking about what you could peer review. I'll discuss how you can become a reviewer and then go through some practical tips for out writing outstanding reviews. So part one, why should you consider being a peer reviewer? There are a number of reasons, but one of the most important is because it will help you improve your scholarship. Reading other people's papers helps you to stay up to date with the current literature in your field. You'll get new ideas about topics for your own work and sometimes methods as well. It'll help you learn what journals are looking for in their manuscripts. And I think the most important part is actually to get in the habit of reading critically and thinking critically about the scientific literature, uh, which will definitely help you in your own writing. Another set of reasons for being a peer reviewer is because it will help you with your career development. A lot of journals will offer continuing medical education credit for reviews. A couple include uh, Journal of General Internal Medicine and Annals of Internal Medicine, but there are lots. Uh, being a reviewer will help establish you as an expert in a field and it will enhance your reputation. Sometimes if you are a particularly excellent reviewer and you're a frequent reviewer, you may even be invited uh, to have a bigger role in, in a particular journal and sometimes even the editorial board. And the editors will get to know you and they may invite you to author editorials or commentaries in their journal. And sometimes if the paper you are uh, reviewing is featured uh, in a particular episode of the journal, you might be invited to uh, write an editorial about that paper. Another set of reasons for being a peer reviewer is because it will give you academic credit. It will help to establish your regional or national reputation, which is an important part of the promotions criteria. And sometimes you can even get awards for being a really good reviewer. Uh, a couple of the journals um, give out awards listed here, and this is just a small sampling. There are lots of journals that help to reward their top peer reviewers. And then last but not least, let us not forget altruism. Peer review is really important for the scientific process and it helps to advance the quality of scientific literature. And more to the point, when you submit uh, your work to a journal, someone else reviews you. So it's important that we all contribute to this process in order to make it work. So I hear this a lot. People say, oh, well, I've sort of thought about being a reviewer, but I'm not really an expert. Um, and I would have to say to that, uh, you are actually an expert. You have had extensive training in internal medicine. You um, may be a contributor to the scientific literature, but at the very least, you are a consumer of the scientific literature. And you represent the journal's target audience. So if a paper is interesting and important in your opinion, it will also be interesting and important in the minds of many of the journal's readers and they value your input. And if you're not sure like what you could possibly be an expert in, there are lots of areas. This is uh, a screenshot of um, a list of topic areas from a journal. And um, you, you know, a lot of the journals will have you select what you're interested in so they can kind of funnel papers to you that you might be interested in reviewing. And as you can see, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of topic areas. So don't be shy. I can promise you you're an expert in one of these areas at the very least and probably many of them. So as you're going through this um, and you're thinking about what to review, Think about what you like to read, because once the journals start sending you papers, you, you know, ideally it's something that you're interested in reading and something where you have a little bit of background expertise. So uh, I recommend picking a couple areas and focusing on them and reviewing well within those areas. Okay, moving on to part two. 
how to become a reviewer. Uh, word of mouth is something you shouldn't underestimate. Uh, if you are interested in being a reviewer, talk to your section head, your mentor, your buddy, whether they write a lot of papers or maybe they're in the medical education circles. Um, many folks get lots of requests for peer reviews and they are only too happy to suggest you as an alternative reviewer if they aren't able to do it or if they know that you're interested in expanding your skills in this area. Another way to become a reviewer is just to reach out directly to editors. Um, most journals will have a, a website where you can see who the editor-in-chief is or um, some of the editorial assistants and feel free to just email them. You can let them know you're interested by sending a CV and letting them know your topic areas. Um, and uh, if you have a mentor, you can also ask your mentor to facilitate some of these introductions as well. And um, even easier, a lot of journals will have an online sign-up form. So they are always looking for people who can help peer review their stuff. So uh, for example, if you go to the Journal of General Internal Medicine, you can just sign up online, register your name, and then select topic areas, um, such as from that large list I showed you a few slides ago. Uh, and that way the journal will start to um, send papers your way that fit your areas of interest. So sign up online. Uh, part three, how to write an outstanding review. So this is um, a little bit more of an in-depth discussion. Um, so I'll go through this by describing to you the purpose uh, of, of doing a peer review and then talk about the structure for how to um, formulate your own review and then some tips on getting it done. So let's start with the basics. What is the purpose of a review actually? Well, at its most basic level, you review to identify the strengths and weaknesses of a manuscript. You can provide uh, helpful suggestions to the authors to improve the quality. And of course, the editors of the journal use your review to guide their decision on whether to accept or reject. And off to the right, you can see kind of a flow chart for how a typical journal will receive a manuscript. Um, do a quick review by the editor to make sure that it fits within the scope of the journal and then send it out for peer review. Um, and then once they receive your peer review, they will redo the cycle um, to um, decide on like acceptance, um, uh, rejection with um, requests for changes or a, a total rejection. So they will cycle through this process several times on occasion before they accept a paper. So what does a peer review actually look like? Um, most journals will have some kind of a structure that they ask for. Frequently, this will take the shape of a recommendation form. Um, this can be an online form or they will give you sections to sort of uh, fill in uh, and some other document uh, and then submit. There's a section for confidential comments to the editor. And then there's a section for comments to the author. Um, and the author sections will usually include an overview, uh, major comments, and minor comments. So here's a sample of a structured recommendation form from a journal. They're not always this structured, um, but it really varies quite a bit from journal to journal. Uh, and you know, you can rate the uh, paper on various criteria and then submit your opinion on a recommendation. For the comments to the editor section, remember that this isn't seen by the author. You can be pretty direct in these comments and usually a few sentences is enough. So this is like the punchline, you know, dear editor, um, you know, if you think that this is a, there's like a fatal flaw, um, something where it's like a really uh, big problem with the design that can't be fixed. There are deal breakers. Like if you don't think this work is their original work, if it's, you know, incredibly poorly written uh, and, you know, it was hard to figure out uh, what the, the paper was trying to say. I mean, there, there are things you can sort of just summarize in the comments to the editors. One key thing though, is to be consistent with the comments to the author. So it's really um, confusing to say to the editor, you know, I hated this paper and here's all the reasons why, and then give no feedback to the author, for example. Um, so just make sure um, that you are consistent across the board. 
Here's an example of comments to an editor. As a hospitalist and medical educator, I found this article interesting and relevant to my practice. However, in this draft, the paper tries to accomplish too many points that detract from the strongest one, etc. Uh, if the focus can be polished, questions about survey design properly addressed, and if the questions about the data answered, this would be a good publication. So this is short, sweet, concise, a couple of sentences that really summarize the high level opinion that you had of this manuscript. Next, I'm going to move on to the comments to the author section. This takes uh, three parts. There's an overview, kind of your big picture, what you, um, you know, sort of summarize for the author, and then major comments and minor comments. So for the overview, generally it starts with something like this. It's your understanding of the article um, and, you know, your opinion on will it advance the literature? Will it change how the field thinks about something? Is this going to be interesting to the readership? And then you can do a summary of the overall strengths and weaknesses, the quality and the originality and innovation. So the overview should just be a couple of sentences. For example, um, and again, this is something that the authors themselves are gonna be reading. Uh, this is a multi-center study that evaluates the excessive lab ordering practices of resident and career physicians. The results reinforce the need to develop a standardized cost-conscious care curriculum in graduate medical education. Clarification of the methodology and elaborating on the results of sub-analysis among specialties as detailed below would strengthen the paper. So um, quite concise, kind of gives you, uh, gives the authors your general gestalt about what they wrote, and then goes on to segue into um, some of your suggestions. So major comments are things that would require um, reanalysis of data, major revisions and rewriting big concerns that if the authors chose not to address this could make the manuscript not publishable. Um, also, by contrast, major strengths um, can be mentioned in the section as well. If there's something that you thought the authors did particularly well or particularly in an innovative way, um, you can mention this here too. Uh, so major comments, you know, really big picture things that you think they need to address before they can, you know, have this be published. Minor comments are things like if you, you know, if the author didn't do it, it wouldn't be a deal breaker, you know, but this, you know, addressing them would help improve the paper. So um, these generally fall into two categories, either opinion or factual error. So opinion things are like style points, minor grammatical changes, you know, terms you prefer, um, and then factual errors are things um, like, you know, revisions of shifting dullness to ascites, you know, it's something that they really should fix. It wouldn't be like a big enough problem to render the manuscript unpublishable, but they really should take care of it. Um, and then um, the final section uh, is to talk about how to actually implement this and some tips for doing peer review well. So here is a list of five key tips that will help you. Number one, check your bandwidth. Number two, slow down. Number three, be thorough. Number four, be pre uh, give precise and actionable feedback. And number five, be kind. So let's dig into these a little bit. Tip number one, before you agree to review, you should understand this is gonna take a couple of hours, at least if you do it well. So do you actually have time for this? You know, be honest with yourself. Even if the paper is, you know, sounds super cool, if you can't, execute this in you know, the needed amount of time, it's better to pass out of respect to the authors and the journal. Uh, is this manuscript in your area of expertise or interest? If this is a topic that you have zero interest in, you're gonna be spending you know, hours uh, of your life working on this. So um, try to stay, stay focused on topics that are sincerely interesting to you. Next, can you make the timeline? The journals are on a schedule. They have issues to publish. They need your review back, usually within a couple of weeks. So if you're in the middle of a major life change or if you're in the middle of an extremely busy um, work cycle or something, it might not be a good time to take on a review. And then most importantly, you know, if you can or can't accept the invitation, please let the journal know either way as quickly as possible because they will reach out to someone else 
And again, this is just a courtesy issue. Please don't sit on your uh, invitation for you know weeks at a time um, because it will delay the review process and it'll just um, hold things up for the authors and everyone else. So please accept or decline immediately. Tip number two, slow down. Recognize that this isn't going to be a process that you do in one shot. Um, some people recommend reading paper, sleeping, you know, looking at it again the next day, um, writing a bit, uh, and then giving it um, a final night's sleep and then sending in your review. So just a slow process to make sure that you're thorough um, and that, you know, you're, um, you're covering all of your bases in your review. So first pass, Read through this uh, paper once to assess the overall tone and readability. Do you understand it? Are the questions and the methods clearly explained? Do you believe it? Does the data justify the conclusions? Are the methods valid? And do you care? Is this something that other people would be interested in reading? Is this important and interesting? Second pass, take some notes uh, and write down some comments. It helps to know the template that the journal use. That way you can enter your comments right into the template on the first go so that you don't have to reformat it all later. Um, as you're reading, call out weaknesses for sure, but also highlight strengths of the paper. And um, lastly, stick to what you know. And um, don't worry, like if you run into a situation where you, you feel out of your depth, uh, to do the technical part of the review, just say that in your review. You can always uh, request additional statistical review. Uh, and so that's often where some of these questions come up. Um, and so don't be shy, you know, or feel bad if you're like, this paper seemed valid, but I am not an expert in this particular kind of statistical method. And I would recommend um, secondary statistical review. That's totally legit to say that if that's how you feel. And it's, it's actually better um, to make sure uh, that the paper is thoroughly reviewed, even if it requires an additional um, level of review. Okay, tip number three, be thorough. Um, usually if you're reviewing for a journal, you're familiar with the journal. Um, so, you know, you may already be familiar with it, but if not, it's nice to like learn a little bit about the journal and uh, figure out their target audience and understand kind of what they usually publish. Very important is the next tip, don't give up before the finish line. Okay, so, you know, a lot of times people read the text of the manuscript uh, and then skip looking at the tables or figures. These are really important for you to review. I can't tell you how many times um, I've caught mistakes um, on, on tables and figures, um, whether it's formatting or whether it's duplication of lines or, or any number of things. It's very, very, very important um, to look at the whole thing and that includes the references just to make sure um, there's anything like odd that jumps out at you. Number three, consider using standardized checklists. So a lot of journals will require this from authors prior to submission, um, especially uh, if it's a, like a systematic review, a meta-analysis or a randomized trial. Like sometimes these are actually part of the submission process. But if not, um, be aware that you can use a Prisma checklist uh, for systematic reviews and meta-analyses, consort checklist for randomized controlled trials, or a star checklist for diagnostic accuracy studies. So um, if you want a little bit of help um, to guide you through your review of these particular types of papers, uh, check out these checklists. Uh, and then finally, the AAMC has a, a peer review checklist that is more generic that you can use for any review. Um, it'll sort of guide you step by step through all of the um, sections of a manuscript uh, and a review. Uh, these are this is very handy actually for your own writing uh, to make sure that you've covered your bases if you are authoring a paper. So um, check this out too. Okay. Tip number four, precise and actionable feedback. Um, so remember, there is a person on the other side of this manuscript who is going to very carefully read what you write. So make sure that you're writing suggestions that are clear and easy to follow. Try not to leave the authors guessing, like, what do you mean by that? Um, I strongly recommend using um, line numbers uh, to guide the authors. So for example, if you say, oh, I think you should change um, this part of your conclusions. 
or that part, you know, don't, don't make it vague, actually tell them like line such and such section, such and such, um, so that they know exactly what you're talking about and that they can address it. Next, if you propose additional areas for the authors to consider, be clear if you think they are essential. The assumption is when you write something in a peer review that the author has to fix it in order for this paper to get published. So if you think it's not actually that important or it's sort of an off the cuff suggestion, you could say um, in your language, you know, consider this or, um, you know, please comment on that. Um, but if you otherwise, if you don't say stuff like that, the authors are going to think that they have to do it. Um, so just be really, really clear on what you're asking them to do. Number four, support your comments with data. So um, if you think that their conclusion is not valid and there is a um, data-driven reason for that, be sure that you um, elaborate on it uh, or ask your question in a way that they can address the data problem that they had. Um, and again, I strongly recommend um, section and line numbers for all of, the, uh, all of these to make sure your feedback is precise. Last but not least, be kind. So um, Elsevier um, quotes that you are not only reviewers, but at the same time, teachers. People don't make mistakes on purpose. So if you teach them the next time, they will submit a better paper. Remember, there is a human being on the other side. It's no fun to get a harsh review. Um, you can be critical, but you can deliver that critical feedback with a collaborative tone and spirit. Um, always reread your review before you submit it to make sure that your comments are worded in a kind way. Uh, there's no need for harshness, um, especially if you uh, have a lot of feedback. The, the authors will get what you're saying without any side commentary. And then finally, don't allow the best to be the enemy of the good. So every paper will have strengths and every paper will have weaknesses. There's no such thing as a perfect manuscript. So um, remember that um, as you're going through and definitely point out what you think needs fixing, um, but not every paper needs to be rejected, um, even if there are flaws, as long as the flaws are, um, are recognized and commented on and acknowledged. Um, oftentimes, even non-perfect papers uh, can find a home in a journal. Okay, um, so uh, reminder that if the paper ends up getting revised and resubmitted, eventually you might be asked to re-review it again when the authors submit the revision. Um, and so as you're going through, pull up your review, make sure that each of your concerns were addressed. The author is expected to submit a point-by-point -point rebuttal of um, your feedback to them and to whoever else reviewed their paper. So they should be doing a uh, line by line, um, you know, comment by comment response to everything that you wrote. Um, so make sure that each of your concerns were addressed. You can identify any new or inadequately addressed issues, meaning like if they didn't really listen to your feedback and their flaw still remains as it originally was and there's no further explanation or acknowledgement, um, that's a problem. Um, but usually authors will be careful to take care of all of these before they resubmit. So it's rare that, that you'll see that, but just be aware. Um, and uh, finally, well-revised submissions will usually be accepted eventually. So if the authors did their point-by-point -point response and they commented sufficiently on your questions and fixed their manuscript um, in general, the paper will end up getting accepted for publication. So in summary, we have taken a grand tour through the entire peer review process. And um, it's actually a really fun and rewarding process. So I hope they'll give it a try. Remember the top tips, check your bandwidth, slow down, be thorough, give precise and actionable feedback and be kind. Uh, and I hope that you will go online or email a member of an editorial board today. Thank you very much for listening.